And I, I think part of what every artist deals with is kind of recognizing a story when it comes to you, when you see one. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is No Violet Bulawayo, whose 2013 debut novel, We Need New Names, won or was shortlisted for every award you can think of, and whose appearance on the Man Booker Prize shortlist was a first for a Black African woman. Her new novel, Glory, is a fable-like retelling of the two years between the overthrow of Zimbabwean president and his death, but with animals and a whole language unto itself. It's a playful, provocative, and funny book that works all on its own and rewards readers familiar with its literary and historical underpinnings with all kinds of treats. And it is my treat to be speaking with its author. No Violet Polawayo, welcome to Kobo. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. For a book about political turmoil and a violent legacy, Glory is a very fun novel. <laughs> was, it, was it fun to write? Did you enjoy writing it? Thank you. I, I'm very pleased to, to hear that. Yes, I enjoyed writing the book. Um, you know, it took about two, two, uh, three and a half years, and I sure had to reward myself by uh, entertaining, you know, uh, allowing myself to be entertained while I was writing. But the thing is that I tend toward dense and heavy subject materials. So humor is what allows me to render my stuff tolerable to readers, um, allows me to go through it as well during the process. So I'm, I'm glad that you found it um, humorous. Jidada is a country of animals, animals who lead countries and plot revolution, who are rich or poor, a, a complete society of what you call mouths. There is a long tradition in literature of animals taking center stage in stories, either in fables that are probably as old as stories themselves, but also in novels like Watership Down, Animal Farm. What made this story and that kind of storytelling um, sort of match so well for you? You know, it was having tried to work with human characters and realizing that the real story that was happening as I was writing was so outrageous that it outperformed my writing. So I thought, okay, um, what do I do as a creative, as a fiction writer, as a storyteller, in order to outperform the real story? And the solution was to look to the animal kingdom for the possibilities of doing what I couldn't otherwise achieve um, with the regular with the regular mode. And of course, I come from that tradition. My childhood, the soundtrack of my childhood is my grandmother's voice telling me these improbable improbable stories of animals doing outrageous things. So I'm, I'm really glad that I had that resource to kind of tap into. And uh, I think it, it worked well. There is a line that comes up repeatedly in the book. This is not an animal farm, but Jidada with a da and another da. Is, is that both a callback and a, and a denial to, <laughs> to animal farm at the same time? <laughs> No, it, 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 it was. I mean, it's impossible not to read Glory and think of, of Animal Farm. Um, the association is pretty much obvious. And it is an animal farm. But the story, I mean, if you consider the fact that it's a story of a nation of animals. But I also wanted to uh, remind the reader that it is also its own thing mm -hmm. with its own shape. Um, they, they are in, in this universe called Jidada in Animal Farm, but also outside of it. The story of Glory is modeled on Zimbabwe after the 2017 coup against Robert Mugabe. Those events are, are quite recent. So I'm, I, yeah, I'm having a hard time figuring out when you had time to write it. <laughs> so when did, like, when did this 
book kind of when did this coalesce for you as a as a book in your mind when did you start thinking this need this story needs to be told no i, I started thinking of it the mom the morning i woke up to the news that mugabe had been deposed that was november 14 2017 i knew there was a story there and i was not the only i was not the only one everybody was on the fall of mugabe and the zimbabwean story and uh, yes, it was a bit challenging the, the subsequent months and years trying to keep track of this drama that was unfolding was a bit challenging because it showed me that I really couldn't do much about things that I was not in control of. Hence, I sort of pivoted um, and worked with fiction. It allowed me the distance to still be engaged with the basics, with the bones of the story but to also start to add my own flesh and meat around it. And most importantly, to kind of look forward outside of the Zimbabwean context to a future that I really would like to see, you know, especially thinking about the, the space of the imagination in helping us envision and create alternate words, alternate realities. Some reviewers have called the book an allegory, but I think it skips over concrete real world things like the, the 1983 political massacre known as uh, Gukurahundi and the ethnic divisions among the Maos that you've included in the book. How did you make those decisions about you know, creating a fictitious country on one hand, but pinning other things to reality and history? Those couple of examples that you mentioned are some things that I cared about and care about as, a, as somebody who grew up in a Zimbabwe where I saw those dynamics actually come to play. The question of ethnicity is a real issue, not just in Zimbabwe, but in many um, African societies, formerly colonized societies. And of course, the paradox is that the question of ethnicity and the tribe itself is a colonial uh, construct, you know, um, mm -hmm. that still haunts us even, even today. I remember that as recently as, I think I was actually doing research on the novel. Um, I was in a bus to South Africa. I had never entered South Africa through the border, never mind, it's only like two hours from Bulawayo where I grew up. And um, at the checkpoint on the Zimbabwean side, the conductor was talking to everybody in the Shona language, which is not my language. And uh, I, I told him that I didn't understand Shona. And he kind of punished me for it, you know, by saying, just stand over there and sort yourself out, um, you know, in this way that, I mean, most Zimbabweans who are not Shonas will identify with this, that we're expected to actually understand the language of the majority, you know. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the weird thing was so many passenger, passengers actually vented, you know, at how I was being difficult. And they made it a tribal issue, like most developed people, you know. And I was like, okay, this thing is very real. But I mean, they are, they are very concrete examples um, in which the, 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 the ethnic thing really plays out and touches people's lives, ranging from issues of marginalization, which regions get developed, um, who is in charge of the government, who holds power, etc, etc. So that was very central. Um, and the Google around the issue as well, uh, something that happened when I was, I think I was, what, between the ages of three up until 1987, when I was six and seven. But again, it still haunts Zimbabwe. And uh, I just want to spot I wanted to spotlight these things because we have failed as a nation, I feel, in coming up with a language around them, in trying to resolve them, and so that we give people closure, so that we deal with our problematic past. So definitely I had to, I had to make those a part of glory because I want to see conversations happen around them. The world outside of Africa also, uh peeks in. There is an, an orange tweeting baboon that shows up very loud, very disruptive. <laughs> did, 
<laughs> did he en- enter the picture after you'd set up your your cast of of animals or was he there from the beginning um he was he was there even before i started writing the book i mean he was a presence and i guess i should be grateful that uh the treating baboon is not treating these days otherwise I would be in trouble. But uh, yeah, I think that's an example of me just looking at the world around and seeing how it fits with, with what I'm, I'm, I'm creating. Um, and I think it, it actually fitted quite well, especially given the space and the role that social media um, plays in the book. We're almost halfway through the book before we meet the character Destiny, who feels like the emotional core of the book. Why was it important for you to have the reader spend so much time immersed in Jadada's politics and especially hearing the voice of Tuvi, the dictator and the former vice president, before we get introduced to Destiny? I I framed the story that way so that we could kind of appreciate the larger picture before we moved on to the intimate, uh, specific story of this young, this young god making the journey back to, to Jidada because, you know, our lives as we live them are very much uh, a product of the spaces that, that we exist in. So I thought that would be a nice way of, of making the reader connect to the story. Glory is a book, as you were just saying, where social media is kind of the chorus that comments on the action. And it's also a parallel world, uh, you call it the other country, uh, which is not to be confused with the country country of reality. Mm-hmm. As, as a novelist, you've come up in the age of social media. Does it just click with you creatively as a narrative device? Or was it something that you had to figure out how to work in? No, I, I think I had to figure out how to work in uh, because I came to social media late. For starters, I didn't grow up around, you know, gadgets and technologies, thankfully. <laughs> it, was, it was a different time. I may not have become the storyteller that I am. But of course, in my mid-20s, it sort of became an inevitable part of my life. I struggled, though, to, to make that connection. Um, but for the purposes of, of, of glory, I recognized that I needed to, to warm up in a way. Um, if anything, just to acknowledge the, the role of, of, of social media in our lived experience, in our universe today. I'm not on Twitter myself. Um, I'm not on Instagram. I'm just on Facebook. I think that's the extent of how much I'm willing to... <laughs> to engage, uh, but that's still enough, you know, to, to bring in the, the kind of noise that allowed me to, to, to shape the glory the way I, I, I did. For people who haven't picked up the book yet, can you introduce the character of, of Destiny to us and, and tell us a little bit about her? Um, Destiny is a meekly aged god, young or meekly aged, I guess that depends on who's talking who is making the return to Jidada um, following the ouster of the father of the nation, who has ruled, who is really the only president destiny has ever known. I think our stories kind of intersect in that way. But she, before that, she leaves for violent reasons. Um, she is abused by the security forces during an earlier election, I think the, the, the timeline for the book is 2008. That also coincides with an election in the real, in the real Zimbabwe. So her return is a bit complicated by the fact that the exile, the refuge, the shelter that she tried to seek outside of Jedada turned out to be no refuge, uh, which kind of speaks to the difficulty that some immigrants have in trying to find homes wherever they, 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 they land, wherever they find themselves. So it's, it's complicated in the sense that it's not a voluntary return. She has to go because she has nowhere to go except to the home from which she fled uh, at least a decade before that. 
She comes to confront her past only to realize that that past is actually tied to her own mother's violent past, a past that she never quite knew because the mother kept this rigid wall of silence around her own trauma. That silence is broken down through the act of storytelling. For destiny, it opens the door for reconciling with her family story, with her history, and by extension with Jidada's violent history, which in turn opens the door for Jidadans to kind of process their own traumas because Destiny's mother becomes the, the, the what do you call it, becomes what makes it possible for Jidadans mm-hmm. to mourn, to mourn their dead, the dead who were killed during the Guguraundi mass murders, for instance, she enacts this memorial um, and thereby setting a chain of events that actually push the Jardins to rise up against the tyranny that has oppressed them for at least four decades and achieve true liberation. Unfortunately, destiny is not around for that, but it doesn't matter. The year that your book, We Need New Names, came out, you were constantly in the kind of the book news world you were named on the five under 35 National Book Award list by the novelist uh, Juno Diaz. I, fiction writing is a, you know, is a, is sometimes a, a strange thing for a young person to be good at because many novelists take many years between projects and take many years to hone your their craft. You're 40 now. And, uh, and when I was 40, I thought, that you know, I actually learned some things between thirty and forty. Um, <laughs> what what do you know as a forty year old novelist that um, that you've gained since you were a thirty year old novelist? Hmm, that's a tricky one <laughs> because uh, I'd like to make you work a little bit. <laughs> yeah, let's see if I have gems of of wisdom to impart to the world. Um, yes. The thing that has been valuable between then and now is kind of understanding who I am as an artist, as a writer. The problem with with all the drama of 2013, I'm very grateful for how We Need New Names was really received. The problem is that, I mean, it was my first book. I had never written a novel before. I was trying to figure my way out. And all of a sudden you are thrust into the spotlight that assumes that you have stuff figured out. And uh, that, that really can be a lot of pressure for a young person trying, still trying to figure themselves out. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad that I, I, there were no expectations, for example, in terms of me following up on the book quickly. So I was able to kind of soak it in and then withdraw and, get back to the studio, um, keep learning, keep growing. And I, I think that was for me the most valuable thing, continue the project of, of personal growth, artistic growth, understanding yourself, what kind of storyteller you are, what kind of stories you will tell. Because with the one book that is successful, there can be those unsaid expectations in terms of what kind of you know, project we are gonna do next. Yeah. And then, of course, building the community, the kinds of friends and support system to carry you through. When you th- were started thinking about your second book, was this what you thought it would turn into or did you have a completely different project in mind? I, I had a different project or even different projects. Um, this one kind of fell on my lap. And I knew that, OK, I needed to kind of put what I was thinking of aside and concentrate on this one. And I I think part of what every artist deals with is kind of recognizing a story when it comes to you, when you see one, you know, because I could have easily said, yeah, you know what, Robert Mugabe, I have already written, we need new names. Let me try, you know, different territory. But the thing is that it's a, I was still writing around the same space, but it was its own 
project, you know, that's that that was its own kind of thing. So I'm I'm glad that I listened to it and and showed up when it asked me to. You mentioned that the the first time you approached the story, you tried it with people, um, and then and then animals came later. What didn't fit? Like what was the what was the either the feeling or the um, the thing that you couldn't express when you were trying to put it in people's mouths? Um, I, I found myself having issues believing my characters. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it is that I was writing about people and events that were so bizarre, you know, to try and capture, especially in the nonfiction mode, without getting into a backstory that would justify why people were doing or were being who they were being. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it became a question of a combination of character and story. And I just thought, you know what, this would be easier to deal with um, in the in the fiction mode. So it was kind of an an education uh, for me. And uh, I really appreciate that part of my training in my 20s, from the time I took my first creative writing class, I think I was 18, 19, um, I challenged myself to check every class as long as it was writing. So I did nonfiction, screenplay, poetry, drama, you know, and, and I think they all kind of served me well when it came to writing glory. I want to take a leap further back in your biography, if I can, and ask you about you know, how you grew up with books in your in your hometown of Bulawayo. Um, this is, you know, we, we ask about uh, not just authors' um, writing lives, but also their reading lives. So uh, what were the books What were the books around you when you were growing up? <laughs> you know, I, I really didn't have a structured reading life when I was growing up, at least the early part of my childhood. Um, and I think it's simply because books didn't figure in the priorities that the adults around me had for mm-hmm. us. So I, I generally read whatever was there. When I saw a book, I read it. It was random reading. Um, but of course, the space of books was, was filled quite generously by oral, oral stories. And, mm-hmm. the, and my imagination certainly benefited from the fact that I had an interesting childhood that was colorful, that was beautiful, and that was crazy um, in all the good ways. It wasn't until later in my schooling, especially when I went to a school with a library, that I discovered the books that all the kids around me seem to be reading. Uh, Enid Blyton, The Famous Five, Heidi Boys, Nessie Drew. There was this Nigerian series called The Pesetas. Um, and of course, books in my native language. So I, I read quite a lot and for the pure pleasure of it, I didn't at that time have grand dreams of, of becoming a writer because I didn't think that was, you know, it wasn't of interest. I didn't think it was possible. Um, so yeah, th- those were my, my, my beginnings. And what was the first story that you remember loving? The first story that, that kind of grabbed you? Uh, the first story that I was, I remember loving, I think Hansel and Gretel, it was a stepmother story. Um, the typical stepmother story. And I think part of why it grabbed me because it felt like I was reading about the little of Violet. You know, I was kind of in the same situation. So it was so fascinating to me that, wow, here was my miserable little life kind of represented in this book written in a country that at that time I didn't even know I would ever see. So it, it, it really grabbed me. And uh, the part of the beauty as well was the collapsing of, of, of worlds. You know, the world started becoming smaller um, the more I started to read. And you describe growing up within a, within a rich oral tradition as well. Did you see the the oral tradition of storytelling and the the book world of stories as being two separate places or was it all mixed in together for you? You know, I, I think it uh, it was mixed because the thing is that stories are stories. 
no matter what, what medium you sort of uh, absorb them in. And what was interesting is that in, in school, when we had to write stories, I really, sometimes I just, what do you call it? I think with, with the, the written medium would be plagiarized. <laughs> But I don't know what you'd call my grandmother. You, you captured in writing. <laughs> I captured in writing and owned the stories and did my own remix, you know. Right. And I'm really happy that my teachers actually encouraged me to do that. You know, there was no there was no pushback. And I think that sort of freed my imagination, allowed me to to play with different styles and see what, what worked. And I think I continued to do that during my growth until I came to my own voice and figured myself on the page. And, and at what point in, in growing up did, did that idea start to spring up like that this would be the thing that you would do, that this, you know, that this was a job that people had, that this would be, <laughs> uh, you know, this would be a career. Uh, after I left Zim for the U.S., I left right after high school um, and took my first creative writing class in college and met like real writers. And I was like, wow, OK, so this is a thing. But it took me about four or five years after that to actually express to my family. I, when I left, I was supposed to go to, to law school to study law. I never made it there thanks to the English classroom and creative writing. So I, I remember that I did not tell my dad until We Need New Names came out. So <laughs> that's, I was like, that's a good okay. time to tell a parent. It's, Look. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so I, I kind of wrote a thing, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Glory came to you quickly um, and sprung out of you quickly. And it seems like with sort of some great force. Do you have any sense of what your next book is uh, is going to be? No, I you know I don't even want to think about my next book. <laughs> okay, <laughs> forget I even asked. <laughs> I am yes, I'm, I'm just taking this time to just uh, relax and reconnect, uh, disconnect, and then recharge. Hopefully, I'll know you know in the next few years. And who are the uh, who are the authors and and what are the books that are around you right now? Um, I just picked up a collection, poetry collection, Customs by Solma Sharif, just yesterday at the store. Um, on my desk is Even the Dogs by John McGregor, mm -hmm. a book that I just open randomly any, any day. And I, I'm really in love with his stylistic inventiveness. Um, there is the sex lives of African women. Again, I, it's, it's one of the books that I keep going back to. So th those are some of the, the books that are around me at the time. And when you started Glory, were there any books that you, that you reached out to or that you reread as you were deciding to embark on, on a fable? Um, I reread for the, I don't know how many times, uh, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, especially for the sheer breadth of mm -hmm. his imagination. You know, um, I needed a book that was license giving that way, that kind of said, it's okay to write a thing where anything happens. And I'm quite grateful for him for that. Then I did read some dictator novels, The Obvious uh, Suspects, The Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wao by Juno Diaz, um, The Wizard of the Crow by Ngugi Wathiongo. I uh, read The Feast of the God and uh, Waiting for the Wild Beasts to Vote. So those were my, my companion, companion books. As, uh, as soon as the the wife of the president reached out and changed the sun. That, that to me felt like a Marquez uh, moment right there. It was fantastic. The audiobook of Glory is, is narrated by uh, Chipo Chong, who does an incredible job. Yes. And, and she is also the voice for uh, 
several novels by uh, Zimbabwean novelist uh, Tsitsi Dang uh, Arembaga. Mm-hmm. What's your relationship with with the audiobooks? Does was that oral storytelling playing much of a role in your writing process as you were putting the book together? Or were you thinking about it being something that someone might read aloud? You know, I, I, I wasn't thinking about it that way. I knew that we needed an audio book. And I had actually told my, my agent up front that I would read it myself because the complaints by most Zimbabweans and Africans were that uh, the American accent didn't work for them with we need new mm-hmm. names. So I was like, well, I'm going to read my own book. And then I ended up writing this big book that was crazy. And I was like, okay, I, <laughs> again, I say that this needs a, a trained professional. And I think Chipo did such an amazing, amazing job. It's, you know, it, it, make, it gives the book color and uh, makes it come to life in ways that I really never imagined on audio. And, and for those who are listening, I, um, I, I cannot recommend it more. The, the, the book itself, the characters come off the page. Uh, Chipo Chung does an incredible job of illuminating the whole thing and bringing it to, uh, bringing it to life. So two equally good experiences. No, Violet, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I have been speaking with No Violet Bulawayo, author of the new novel, Glory. All of the books we talked about can be found at kobo.com slash conversation. Check the show notes for a link. Be sure to catch every conversation by subscribing wherever you listen. Kobo in Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening.